Welcome to the Heartbeat for Hire podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Dowd. My goal is to help train leaders and sales organizations how to manage and deliver results with empathy, compassion, and kindness. Let's get started. Greetings and welcome to this episode of Heartbeat for Hire. I've got a great guest for you today. Will Fuentes is the co-founder of the Maestro Group. Will focuses on teaching both hard and soft sales skills and identifies opportunities to improve sales efficiencies, and he's a master at it. He's been in sales for more than 20 years, spanning retail and tech. Will spent eight years with national retail chains training their staff and managing stores. He then built a retail SaaS company that was on the cutting edge of in-store personalization and assisted sales. He's been hired by multiple organizations to train their salespeople to close more and accelerate the sales cycle and increase deal value. We have so much to talk about. Welcome, Will. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. It's my pleasure. So I know you have a pretty incredible story. Would you do us the honor of giving us some of your background? Uh, yeah. So um, I was born and raised in Northern Virginia, right side of Washington, D.C., first generation American. Um, I went to a specialized high school called Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. Um, it is relevant to the story later, um, but <clears throat> I left school. I already uh, had about two years of college credits done. So I went to Virginia Tech, graduated early from Virginia Tech, was 20 years old when I started law school at GW Law School, um, was writing speeches for a presidential candidate. You know, by the time I was 21, uh, had a great law firm job upon graduation and then failed the bar. Um, so oh. failed the bar and at 23 years old was, uh, you know, out of law school. My friends are, some of them are still in college trying to figure out what to do. Uh, went to work for a very small firm that I had worked at, uh, from college through law school, uh, trying to just figure out what to do next. And my youngest brother was working at Best Buy and it was the holidays. And he was like, Hey, you should come work with me at Best Buy, make some extra cash and you get good discounts. So I went to work there. Um, and it was going to be a part-time thing for the winter, for the holidays and found out I was really good at it. Um, we were a test store for a concept called customer centricity, um, based on a book by Larry Selden called angel customer, demon customer. And, um, I, I was able to be pretty creative in terms of the, like how I sold and things that I created, I created a tracker and had a great opportunity to, to really kind of influence the store and, um, eventually, you know, they, they, they gave me an offer to, to stay on board. And, you know, at the time it's like, oh my gosh, I have a law degree. I've done really good. I'm going to get this amazing <laughs> offer. I'm thinking I'm going to go to corporate and I'm going to influence the company. And they're like, you can make $8 and 50 cents an hour, but you'll be a full-time employee and get benefits. <laughs> I mean, um, what a switch. I mean, <laughs> and, and to do all the law school stuff and then find yourself selling laptops, like, Oh my gosh, that had to be such like a, a head spinner for you. Yeah, it really was uh, for myself. I mean, it, it's not, you know, it was, it was really kind of like, I don't think it was like, I'm going to make a career out of this. It was like, I was, you know, 23, 24. I'm working with a bunch of like 20 year olds. The environment, there's a lot of fun. Um, you know, you you play video games, you watch movies in the in the theater room, you know, I, it, it was, it was, I was good at selling. I like talking to people, but it really was not a serious decision outside of like, what am I going to do with myself? Like I had never failed so spectacularly, like I just had. So it was like, I didn't, I was lost. I yeah. really was lost. Right. And retail and Best Buy were kind of like this opportunity um, for me to use some natural skills that I have, um, which again, this becomes that, that phrasing becomes relevant to the story later. Um, and so I just decided to fall into it. And, you know, the hardest part, someone asked me recently, like, what was the most difficult part or what was the con of working? And, and really for me, the, the most difficult part was dealing with my family and friends, mm. right? Because looking of their expectations, yeah, I mean, you know, the idea was I was, you know, going to go to law school, going to become a lawyer, be a partner before I was 30, run well, for Well, and you career. were the family hero, the first generation American, you went to law school, you did it all early, so they probably couldn't understand it. 
Well, yeah, and and you know, so so two two very very uh, important points here that I, that I need. So three very important points that I need to make. Number one is my grandfather was an orphan, um, and in El Salvador, um, but taught himself math and statistics and had a graduate degree from Vanderbilt University and came to the United States, um, you know, working for the Organization of American States. So he had created a very good life bringing his family here. Number two, his youngest son. Um, my father's younger brother um, had graduated medical school and was a doctor. So like, but as his career was taking off, he died in a car crash. Oh. And so there was this kind of like loss a little bit yeah, in terms of, of like, we came to America, you know, the American dream. Yeah. Third point is my father went to interesting, um, went to Hammond, which if you know anything about, uh, Disney movies, and you ever watch, remember the Titans, Hammond was a school that integrated with T.C. Williams. Yeah. So he went to Hammond, and his senior year, my grandfather got called into the office and was told by a vice principal or principal, I can't remember which, that he should take my dad and his brother out of school and put him into construction because they weren't ever going to achieve anything in the uh. U.S. And so Upon, yeah, so when my uncle graduated uh, medical school, they sent him an invite. But my father, you know, ended up in banking and had a nice career there. But for him, he always felt like there was something missing. He didn't finish college. He 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 stopped he stopped going. Um, you know, got into banking and and really you know wanted all of us to graduate. All of us graduated. All four all four uh, kids graduated from college and was super excited about his son, the the attorney, the lawyer. I mean. This is in 2001, 2002. And up until maybe 2020, he still told people I was a lawyer. I mean, it's like, I'm not like, oh stop saying God. that. I graduated. You know, so, so, um, you know, so I think for me, that was probably the toughest part was dealing with all of those expectations and, and just feeling like, okay, I had this amazing path that, you know, that was, that was in front of me. And, and my grandfather had done all these amazing things in order to get us to an opportunity to be wow. able to do that. And here I am, you know. And now I tell people like it was the best education I ever got was working in retail, learning about customers, learning about individuals, learning about how people buy, learning how to manage, learning how to lead. I mean, if you can motivate a 16 year old to care about the dust on a baseboard, right? Like, you, you know, you could probably motivate a salesperson who's making 150 that's staring at a commission of $50,000 to do a little bit of extra work. You can learn how to motivate people if you can motivate a 16 year old. Trust me. I, I, um, I love that. And, you know, just because you didn't pass the bar, it doesn't negate all, everything you learned. So you still had all of that education under your, you know, under your hat to, to lean on. Um, so how did you know? that you were good at sales. I mean, obviously, like you started connecting with clients or customers and you started really, you know, seeing it happen. But what about the sales process was really kind of clicking for you? So there was a couple of, there was a three three specific moments at Best Buy that I can point to um, that, I, that I recall. The first one being, I was put into the digital imaging department at the time, again, to young kids, like, you bought cameras, you bought digital cameras. Yeah. Um, they weren't on your phone, right? You had a flip that didn't have a camera, right? So you bought digital cameras. And it was during the holidays. And um we were selling a lot of cameras, but that was it. And there wasn't a lot of margin in the cameras. And people were talking about how the department was losing money and people were having struggling to understand what but we hit our revenue number every day. Like we hit our target. How are we losing money? You know, so there's less hours for people, right? Like people are discussing sure. that. And and so obviously the money's in the accessories. And so like, you know, like the batteries or the case or all this, those are margin rich project uh, products as well as the service plans. And what I realized was if I could talk to someone about the experience that they were trying to create by buying this camera for someone, I could sell accessories. Mm. And so my technique would be like, oh, you know, I would ask someone, yeah, who are you buying this for? It's for my wife. Okay. When is she going to open it on Christmas? Great. What do you want her to do with it on Christmas? Well, I'd love for her to take pictures of the kids. Okay. Well, this camera actually doesn't come with a memory card. Um, so she's not, not going to be able to Let's do have that. it be she's ready. The memory yeah. card, right? Like, yeah. and oh, are you, do you guys go anywhere for Christmas? Yeah, we travel to mom and dad. Okay, so she'll probably want to put it in a case because the screen can scratch up in her purse. Blah blah. blah. And so, like, I, I figured out how to. And so, you know, I helped create a tracker for the team to be able to like track their accessories to remind them to ask these questions. And so we ended up selling a lot more units, and our margins went up, and that got noticed. 
Then another thing that got noticed, I was selling a washer and dryer to a mom with four kids. She had come in, her washer had just died. Um, and she was like, we're going to replace them both. They're, they're old. And so I saw the four kids running around and I was just like, okay, let me ask you a couple, like she wanted the cheapest one. And I said, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. And, you know, it's like, Hey, do your kids play sports? How, you know, how often, like, are you doing laundry, et cetera? Like what's your water bill look like? And I'm just like, I walked her to a product that was better water efficiency, better cycles, had steam cycles that like all the uniforms could get clean, all this stuff. They had babies. It would clean all this. And, you know, she ended up buying, you know, she ended up selecting that and she bought the service plan or selected the service plan. When we got to the register, I, I could sense something like I could just sense she wasn't comfortable. Yeah. So I said, listen, I 100% believe that the washer and dryer you've selected is the right one for these reasons. I also believe that these are the reasons why you think the service plan makes sense. If any of those reasons don't make sense to you, let's stop right now and let's yeah. go reselect and rethink about it. You know, and she was like, I just needed to hear that it was okay for me to say no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. I love that. And it was like just this kind of moment, right? That like we're communicating with humans and as long as we can understand that and I you know, at the time I didn't recognize the value of it. Now I do. Well, you built um, some trust in a very short transaction. Yeah. And you you said, you know, I'm giving you permission to get out. And yeah. I think people love that. Oh no, it's my decision. I'm not feeling forced into it. So that's right. That's, that's really smart. And then the third experience was I got moved to the big leagues. So in Best Buy at the time, the big leagues was home theater department. I mean, that's like where the plasmas were coming out. You know, there's yeah, at the time, like 42 inch plasma might cost you $10,000. Think about that. Like today you get them for like a hundred bucks, right? At the time it was $10,000. Um, and so we get moved into the big leagues and oh there's God. a gentleman that comes in, an older gentleman. And I just still remember he's like wearing overalls and stuff. And like, you know, his winter, like car heart gear and stuff and comes in <laughs> and he was like, Hey, <clears throat> uh, and I see you guys have this 36 inch TV, um, on sale. Uh, I'd like to buy it. And most people, what they do in that situation is they grab the TV, they throw it on the cart, they bring them out and like sales done. And, you know, it's great. Now I want to move on to someone else that is asking me for a plasma. Sure. Right. And I, I said, yeah, happy to put it on the cart for you. Um, but I just want to ask you a couple of questions. And I started asking him a couple of questions. And it turns out that the reason he was buying a bigger TV was because his wife was like losing her sight a little bit. And she also couldn't really move. And they used to watch, they used to go to hockey games to watch mm -hmm. the Caps. And uh, she couldn't go to the games anymore. And so he wanted to watch them on the TV with her. And so he wanted something bigger so she could see it. And so I said, hey, at the time, you know, this is now common, but HD was just coming out. I was like, have right. you seen HD? You know, actually the NHL has a contract. They're the one sport right now that is in HD. Let me oh, show wow. it to you. So I showed it to him. And he was like, this is amazing. What do I need? I said, well, you can't watch this on your 36. That's just standard TV. You need an HD TV. You need these type of cables. You need this type of service. And walked him all the way through it. Got it all set up. Had Geek Squad go out and set it up for him. So he didn't have to worry about it. All that good stuff. Yeah. Sales done. A couple of days later, I'm selling to another person. And I feel a tap on my shoulder. And it's the man. And so like most people are like, it's like, oh my God, he's going to come return everything. But before he's before I can say something to him, he looks at my customer and says, whatever this man is selling to you, he's doing it because he's got your best interest at heart. Love that. He's like, my wife and I are watching hockey Aww. and she feels like she's at the game Aww. and she can't believe what she's seeing on the TV. And then he looked at me, he said, thank you and walked away. Oh, you gave him his wife back. I mean, yeah. that's like the best sale you could ever make. That's so cool. Yeah. And so those were like kind of the three moments where I was like, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at this thing. <laughs> so, okay. So you're at Best Buy, you you moved into the big leagues, then what happens? Uh, so at the time I had one of the largest sales ever in its history. I had sold to this gentleman who walked in uh, like $120,000 like system. Holy moly. Um, and that, that like, be, that was right before they, um, started working with Magnolia Home Theater, et cetera. And so got some opportunities to work with Magnolia Home Theater, start to train teams, start to train, like we learned Magnolia. And now I'm training the team on like those concepts and all this other stuff. And, you know, the, the time there is, is going great, but like I'm not moving in the direction that I want to move to. Mm -hmm. um, and so as quickly now, like, you know, this is again, the I think the biggest lesson I learned, um, you know, just in my life is that like, 
you know, sometimes you got to take chances and and then sometimes you just got to trust your gut, right? A little bit. Right. And so at this time, like, I was like, you know, I, I think I need, I need to move on. Um, so I went to Bed Bath & Beyond, um, worked there, um, did some inventory stuff. It was, it was good. Um, had a, you know, pretty good success there. Um, then I moved on to HH Greg, had some good success there, kind of helping launch the market, helping sales. And um, my son was just born, but I wasn't making a lot of money and I had a law degree <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, you know, um, which is interesting because I, I made more money at Best Buy and then for, and then Bed Bath & Beyond and HH Craig because it was like a growing business. I was like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to yeah. be my shot, right? Like, so, you know, I took a massive pay cut thinking that I could blow something up there and really get to the position I wanted, which is like a executive, you know, for a major retail. Sure. Um, and, you know, that was not, it was, I was so like, I just, I just had this desire to do something else. Um, and so my son was born and my wife and I were having a conversation and she read an article about a technology that was like they, they were announcing. And she said, do you remember like our second or third date? Like you mentioned this thing. And I was like, yeah, she's like, well, it's like, they've launched it. Look at the article. She's like, do you have any other ideas? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, actually I do. And she was like, you should probably try and do something with one of your ideas. I love it. I so, love it. Yeah. So went out and took uh, what had made me successful in retail, which was this. Sales is sales and that's great, but I couldn't replicate that. What I could replicate was that one of the things that I would do with every customer that wouldn't buy was I would ask them a very specific question which was this, are you not buying because of price or because you just don't want it, mm. right? And if it was price, I would say, okay, so what price do I need to call you to let you know it's gone on sale? Sure. And well, so I was like, I can actually create a pretty simple platform that allows people to record that information and then send a text message when it goes on sale. Yeah. So that was the idea of, of, of my software to start off with. It was just recording information at the point of non-sale, reason why, and then contacting the people at the appropriate time. I love it. Um, but all of that information needed to be on an iPad. <laughs> and iPads were just new and stores right. were not spending four or $500 per associate to walk around wow. with an iPad. So the costs are a little bit out of whack. The idea was good. Um, and, you know, uh, I had I had what you would call like that, like, you know, uh, that success that people find to be success, but it's not at all. And what I mean by that is like, I was, you know, I was interviewed by like different publications. I was on the cover of the Washington Business Journal. I, there's a lot of these things that happened, but the company was just kind of like middling or long and getting little pilots, but not really being able to push all the way through. And like a lot of startups, you know, it, it needed to find a safe home. And so we found a safe home for it and off we were. Um, and, you know, from, from there, it was like, okay, you know, like, what do I do now? I went to work for someone that I had met during um, my time at um, uh, at Lemur and and learned a ton. There was a, a woman named uh, Cheryl Sullivan who taught me a ton about marketing and sales and positioning. She was a former Oracle person. Um, and she ran, uh, you know, uh, the product and sales at, um, at this company called Revionics and had a fantastic time there. And I started a little side hustle uh, uh, training teams like sales teams um, from seven o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock in the morning. So I would make these sales people show up at 7 a.m. to do training, like just, you know, because that's like when I could do it. Yeah. <laughs> My job was remote before remote was a thing. And so right. like from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., I would train the team. And then I would like, Asked my clients if I could work in their office for my eight hours. And I was like, oh, you know, I can have lunch with your team, whatever. And so they would give me office space and that's where I would do my work. Well, I had a client give me um, an opportunity to join their team. And so I took that. Um, we had been working together for about nine months. We had a fantastic uh, uh, relationship as a client and consultant. Um, but it's very difficult for an organization to have two chiefs. And so like... When I moved into the role of employee, it, it, it did not did not work as well. Our mm -hmm. dynamic was not as strong. And so um, <clears throat> about a month in, you know, he kindly 
let me know that it wasn't working out yeah and that i should move on um i had about uh two weeks worth of cash for our expenses in our bank <sighs> account um you know I, we had incurred quite a bit of debt over the few years of lemur and running the businesses and all this and um called my wife i was like you know felt pretty sorry for myself for about a hundred feet i always say it was a hundred feet from where i got fired to where my car was parked and i allowed myself to feel sorry for myself for that amount of time got in the car and said hey i'm gonna start a business and i'm gonna teach people how to sell and she was like cool i'm in oh i love it <laughs> and uh put it out into the world that that's what I was doing. And a week later had my first client. Amazing. A couple of weeks later had my second, a couple of months later, you know, now had multiple people on my team. Um, but what was unique was as I was trying to build the business, one of the things I, I, I did was I went and tried to figure out what made me good at selling my services. So I had some people, industrial organization, behavioral psychologists kind of like help me out. Like, what am I doing that's making things work? Um, and so that's what became the beginnings of the Phoenix sales method and the drive sales methodology was the understanding of what I was naturally doing and understanding, was there a reason like that it worked and would it work for others? And so you, you hit on one thing earlier, which is some of the things is like building that trust, yeah. you know, other things is just, um, <clears throat> the, the consistency in terms of how I always started my meetings and did certain things a certain way, right? It just, mm -hmm. it made people feel comfortable, right? And so there was just these little things that I started to learn about um, how I asked for time. Like I would always present three times. And this was not a product of like, I had this genius thing. It was really was like, I need to manage the fact that I'm trying to run a business, trying yeah. to like raise my son, trying to do all these other things. These are the only blocks that I have. <laughs> so I can't tell people that I have unlimited. Right. Um, and so I started to learn all these things and that's what really started to become kind of the foundational pieces for, 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 uh, for Maestro. And, you know, over time that has become kind of the thread of our company, which is that we are like, we do a ton of research on industrial organizational and behavioral psychology to better oh understand what's going on with buyers as well as sellers. Well, and I think that really hits on um, a lot of leaders who their sales organizations are struggling. They can't always understand why they pin it on specific leaders or they pin it on, you know, our products are failing. And I think getting to the psychology of human behavior is such a smart way to look at it because like, as you illustrated before, you know, how you were getting these people to buy and acknowledging their, their trepidation and, you know, being able to overcome that with, you know, gaining their confidence. I thought that was really, really smart. So I want to just pivot because one of the things sure. that we love to talk about on this podcast is leadership. And you obviously had a fair amount of bosses and you're a leader now, plus you were motivating people to do things they were uncomfortable with or different than what they knew. Talk about your experience with leadership and, and how it's um, really shaped you. I've had a couple of, of, of great leaders in my life. Um, and, you know, I think for me, the thing that is like, number one has always stood out is when I look back, what made them great leaders was consistency. Like I always knew what to expect and whether they were like nice people or not nice, it didn't really matter. Right. Like they were just consistent. And mm -hmm. so that allowed me to operate in a very good space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think um, that's often kind of like a forgotten thing. People are like, hey, you just need to be really good to your people. And I, I think that starts obviously with consistency, right? Like this is just the way this person operates. So I understand what the rules of engagement are. Yeah, clear expectations. And I understand what's important yeah. and what's not. I think for me, the the the, the biggest like uh, inflection point in, in terms of just understanding leadership was my first opportunity to lead a team at Best Buy um, I lasted six weeks and like six weeks in, you know, they called me into the office and basically were like, Hey, like we can promote you to customer or you can take a step down and go back to a salesperson. Mm. And I was like, but why? And they're like, your people hate you. Your numbers suck. Oof. You don't motivate like, you know, your department while yes, it looks good. Um, you know, you're tyrannical and like, it's just very difficult to work with you. And we get a lot of call outs when people know that you're going to be on the floor. Wow. So that's, that's a hard lesson, but you took it 
and learned from it and never repeated that or what happened? Yeah, yeah. So it is a hard lesson. And so uh, what I took from it, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've repeated it or not. I mean, I'm sure there's been times that people have found me to be just intolerable and difficult to work with and stuff. Um, but what I what I did learn was that, you know, this idea that's on TV of these bosses that are just, you know, crazy and they demand so demanding and stuff like right. that's that doesn't work <laughs> and, no. most, and it most certainly was not going to work with 16 year olds that like are just doing it because like, you know, there's, they just want some extra mm-hmm. cash specifically in an area where I live, where there's like hundreds of retailers, there's a mall across the street, right? Like yeah. they can just go work there. Like, why would they work here? Right. Um, and so I, I, I think I, what I started to understand by that was like, you know, t- leadership isn't title. Um, and, and so, because like, that's how I was leading, it was like, do it because I said so. Not yeah. Well, I have the authority. You have to like me. You have to do what I say. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Um, and, and so what I started to learn was that, like, that's not the case in terms of like being a strong leader. Isn't just title. Right. And, and quite honestly, like when I went back to become a salesperson, I learned how to influence without authority and like how to influence, you know, my colleagues, you know, without any sort of real authority with, you know, like, you know, by example, by, mm-hmm. you know, by, by humility, by asking them for help, by understanding like what their strengths were and trying to learn from their strengths yeah. in turn, in, in turn, so, so that I could teach them the things that I was good at, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in a much more like virtuous teaching cycle type of environment. Um, and, and so that became kind of a, a good point. Now I would say like, over time, I've now also learned a couple of different things, and this you know may may go counter to probably what others have said on on your on your podcast before. But I do think I, I do think there are moments where a leader just has to trust themselves mm-hmm. and believe that like not every opinion matters in that case, mm-hmm. and 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 the team needs to know that the leader's capable of doing that. Well, leaders have to make tough decisions. It can't yeah. always be, let me hear all of your feelings before I make this choice. I mean, there is a difference between knowing what's right for the business, moving decisively and steamrolling your people. You're not doing that. You're basically saying, I have to make this decision. You don't get an opinion here, but I want to hear like your ideas about why you have reservations and let's talk it through. I mean, I, I think there's a big difference between because I said so and, you know, yeah. let me explain why I'm making this choice. Yeah. And, and I think that's where most people struggle, right? Is because they feel like it's like, if, if I'm going to be the type of leader that hears people's opinions, then I can never tell them that in this moment, it doesn't matter or that yeah. we need to move forward or that we need to stop the conversation. Yeah. And so when I talk to leaders, that's always like, like a struggle point. Um, the other point is, is I always tell people like your job as a leader is to protect the whole, right? And so like, if you're making decisions based on the individual and that individual situation and they're damaging the team, Mm. then you're being ineffective as a leader. You're actually like your, your, your own, like it's literally your own ego or your own self soothing that you're doing here. Like you don't want to be the bad guy having to fire the individual who's having issues that has not shown up for seven critical meetings and his team's always scrambling and all this thing. And you understand he has issues. So you don't want to let that person go. And it's like, but the impact, the stress that it's causing on the others, like that matters too. Yeah. It it totally does. And one bad apple can spoil the bunch. And, you know, I always say, you know, people quit managers, they don't quit companies for the most part. But when a manager doesn't act decisively, when there's somebody who's really being um, a problem, you know, it's just as damaging. I I totally Uh agree. Um, the, The level of you know, it's so hard, right? Like uh, organizations function and run well when there's a high level of accountability. Mm. And when like you uh, allow that accountability to slip because for whatever reasons, and, and and by the way, like it's an HR nightmare to go tell some, like you can't go tell someone, oh, well, you know, they've had these seven massive issues in their personal life. And this is why we're giving them a little bit of grace. It's like, yeah. you can't do that. <laughs> no. no, yeah, no, it's, I mean, you have to, you have to find the right place for that person and yep. you you have to handle it with care, but your team needs to know that you're handling it. 
That's right. There's nothing worse than watching someone get preferential treatment and they're a shithead because that's just not fun for anyone. Um, yeah, that's right. So talk a little bit about what Maestro does and the services you offer. Yeah. Uh, so we are what we call a sales acceleration firm. Um, basically, we handle all like aspects of sales uh, for an organization. Like we can consult and, or we can be a partner in all of them. So everything from recruiting to helping someone create their onboarding program mm -hmm. to interim uh, CRO or VP or director of sales uh, mm -hmm. positions. But at our crux and foundation um, is training. So mm -hmm. we offer core trainings and all of our engagements are wrapped, even if it's an interim CRO, or even if it's like a recruiting, like we're going to give you some training in some aspect, right? So like there's a specific way that we think about recruiting. There's a specific way that we think about hiring, right? Like there's a formula for it. There's a way to do it. And so we'll, we train all organizations on it because, you know, my whole goal as a sales acceleration firm is not to be the partner forever. It's the mm. to accelerate, <laughs> right? It's the sprint. It's to get you to the good place and then mm. leave you in a great place that you can do it on your own. Well, um, and you, so you have a pretty change. wide variety of services you can offer. So even if you finish with one project, I know that you do other things too. So I know that your clients are pretty happy with you. And um, I imagine they want to work with you in other capacities. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we have a new vintage of clients that have just come in over the last six months, but, uh, for the previous six, uh, for the previous time ahead of that five and a half years, every client that has ever bought a service, like a core service from us, mm -hmm. um, has bought another service, uh, from us as well. So hundred percent re-engagement rate if they do some core. Now, when we do one-off mm -hmm. stuff, like, Hey, write a couple of emails for us. Cause we have some great writers. One of the things for me, um, and this goes a little bit back to leadership and stuff. Um, is is that one of the things that I wanted to build at Maestro was a place for incredibly intelligent people to come mm -hmm. and work, regardless of whether they had any sales experience or not. So on our staff, we have former scientists, mm -hmm. we have uh, world-renowned poets. Um, you know, we have uh, JDs, <laughs> we have fundraisers. Uh, you know, we, we, we have this wide variety um, of, of individuals. And for me, because what I have felt is that like, <clears throat> you know, when I first started, my, I remember people being like, well, I don't know if I want to hire you. You're like a really good retail sales guy, but what do you know about construction sales? Right. And I was like, well, I know that it's human beings that are buying your stuff. So like, I think, I, I think I have a pretty I'm good, pretty good at the conversation, but yeah. 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 And, and so like, I did, I never wanted to discount someone because they didn't have experience in sales. And the second thing is, is for me, and, and this can be difficult uh, for, for highly intelligent people that come to work for us is that I, I try not to limit uh, people's creativity. And so a lot of people love to be like, well, what does he expect? And it's like, I expect you to produce the best possible work. I'm not going to tell you what my expectation is because like I have limited like, you know, understanding of what this final product should look like. Right. You know, I hired you because you're smart. You're probably going to come up with something 10 times better than I could ever create. And if it's not, we'll work on it together. And so for me, like I want people to be able to explore the possibilities and create oh, some amazing stuff. Love that. Oh, I love that. I mean, Will, that that was such an integral piece of how I led my teams. And I, I called my teams Mavericks and Hustlers. And, and I purposely gave them room to stretch and to try new best practices. And I consistently told them, I've got your back. So do what you need to do to figure out how can we do this better? There's got to be another way. It's not only one way of selling. So try and try exploring new things, have different conversations, tell a better story. And um, it really invited people to stretch and to do more. And we developed so many best practices as a result. So I love that that's so core and fundamental to your philosophy. That's just so cool. Yeah, I, I do want to make something clear for people who um, have participated in our training because they'll like, you know, I often talk about the science of sales and that there is a process of sales. And, and one of the things that like the people that do excellent in our training figure out is the second part of it, which I say the art of sales is your authenticity. It's the stories mm -hmm. you tell. It's how you react to the stories that your prospect is telling you. It's how, you know, you use your curiosity to move conversations forward. But there is a process and an understanding of how you gather information, how you ask questions, you know, in a way that makes that open and stuff. And, and so like, 
uh, you know, like for me, I always tell people like, that's where I want you to explore your creativity, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's even, even improv is there's some constructs, right? There's words that you're using in order and you're playing within those constructs and same with sales. You got to play within those constructs in order to go beyond them um, with your own personality and your own authenticity. And I think like, okay. that's a difficult concept for people. It's either like, they feel like I got to be myself hundred percent of the time. And I don't want to follow any rules about follow up or when to talk, you know, all these things. And it's like, well, that's not, no, there's process. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but you need some guardrails. I, I totally agree. Um, yeah. Okay. So you have this, you know, team of Mavericks and really intelligent people, and you get to work with a lot of different companies. I'd love you to share some of your observations of culture. And um, I mean, in my mind and where I've been and where I am now, I've seen a shift and I'm curious if you have too. Um, when you say shift, what, what do you mean? Like, do you mean so like it feels to me like there's this really um, massive shift going on right now to for authenticity, sharing vulnerability as leaders and honoring um, people's experiences, really kind of opening up um, your leadership style. The, that old tyrannical, aggressive style is no longer welcome. And um, I think leaders are being pushed in a different direction now to create this culture that is um, psychologically safe and, um, allows people to shine. Um, and I don't think that's been a focus up until recently, but I'm curious what you think. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, interesting, uh, observation. I, I do think that I, I think there's a, there's, there's something else that I've observed. Um, we have a very immature crop of leaders trying to execute on a very difficult very, very difficult uh, leadership style, yeah, which is you know creating that psychological safety space while still driving, yep, um the business, right? or or whatever part of the business that that you're running, whether it's a product team, a marketing team, a sales team, an operations yep. team, right? and And so I think like there's a massive gap right now in terms of coaching and leadership coaching and, and how to do that, yeah, like, and how to That's do that here for. Effect. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Like, and how to do it effectively, right? And like, this to me is 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 like very similar to that moment in, in, in like sales for me, where it was like, there is a science, there is something behind how you do all of those things. And if you can crack that code and teach people like what those like parameters are and those guardrails, they can be successful at it. But people are wildly inconsistent, right? Yeah. And so like, it's like, they're wildly inconsistent and they often, and it's funny, this is one thing I've noticed a ton because I do, I do talk to executives a lot and it's like, you know, they struggle with like, Hey, I have to hit this number, but I don't want my team to know that that's, what's driving me. Mm -hmm. I want them to think that what's driving me is, is their experiences with us. And it's like, listen, it's okay for them to know that yeah. you have to hit a number and that's what you're driving towards. Yeah. Like expectations. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but how you get it, there is the is the nuance. That's the yeah. choices you have to make. I also I also will tell you I'm a, I'm a little bit old school sometimes, right? Like sometimes I feel like um, I, I do think experiences matter. I do think all of those things matter. But um, you know, and then I'm like, this is probably going to be really controversial. My team is going to be like, why did you say that? Um, but <laughs> like, no. So sometimes I, I do feel that. Um, Younger yet generations often feel that those experiences are as valid as someone who might have had 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Yep. And I, and I'm, trust me, like I, I've trained people that have been, you know, 20 days into sales yep. to people that have been like selling for 40 years. Right. And so I get it. Like, sometimes I'm like, well, oh, that's just so old school and they don't get it or whatever else. Right. And like, I fall into that trap. Right. Cause I'm like, there's a new way of doing it, but you know, they've been successful for a reason. So like, what can I suss out of that? Like that yeah. will help me become better is very difficult for all of us to do. It's also very difficult for all of us sometimes to just kind of sit in the space and allow someone else to that, like who we don't agree with to share that experience and, yeah. and say, well, maybe they might know a little bit more than me. Yes. They maybe their experience actually tells them a little bit more about what's going on in this situation than mm -hmm. what I understand it be having it be my first or second time encountering this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and nobody, I don't care how senior of a leader you are, nobody has all the answers. You're yeah. always learning, you're always growing, and people are always teaching you if you give them the opportunity to do it. 
Um, so yeah, I totally agree. And I don't think what you said was so controversial. Um, I, I will say one, one final point. And I just want to, you know, for all you listeners to point this out. So the one thing that I have found to be like, so I, I don't think this was as, you know, uh, this was as uh, inconsistent before as it is today. The ability to be coached today, like it really stands out. Yeah. When I meet someone who is is able to be coached, um, you know, versus someone who I feel is closed off to that is respectful of title or whatever it is that they're doing with their leader, but really they're just not taking it in or doing yeah. anything with it. It's really noticeable because, um, you know, we, we have spent a lot of time, you know, over the past couple of decades, you know, allowing things to be kind of good enough and like not being able to learn to process constructive criticism. And so when I meet, you know, doesn't matter whether young or old, a salesperson that's like super coachable, it's like, whoa, this is like mind blowing to me, like just how open they are yeah. to trying to get better. Yeah. And so like, if you want to stand out in the world, become coachable. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. I love that. All right. Well, what would you like your legacy to be? This is a good question. So my grandfather, when he passed away, um, I was uh, honored enough to be able to eulogize him. And the message that like, he was a resilient person. Like I said, he was an orphan. He lived, grew up in the slums of El Salvador and you know, taught himself all this stuff. Um, and, and many people would take that and just say, I did it. And like, you better figure it out yourself. But he wasn't, he helped people throughout his life, right? And it wasn't financial help, it wasn't like, here's a, this. It was, he gave of himself and gave of his time and like really, and so I, my driving force today is that I want to change people's financial futures by teaching them the things that I know how to do in the hopes that they can achieve their financial goals and have you know the things that they want. I love that. But what I really truly want my legacy to be is is I, is I, is I want my, my son to be able to look and say, you know what? My dad had a positive impact on a lot more people's lives than he had a negative impact on. Mm -hmm. And he left the world a better place. And I... His name is George. I, George, want to do the same. And so that's really what I, at the end of the day, I, I just want people to feel like more people than not, that I had a positive impact on their lives. And I want my son to continue that tradition that comes to me from my grandfather and my father, mm -hmm. now to myself and on to him. Well, I think you're on your way, my friend. So congrats on that. that. Um, how do people find you? Uh, so they can find me uh, on a uh, slightly active Twitter, <laughs> uh, it's w one is 3 or actually the easiest way is you can just email me, will at maestrogroup.co, not .com, .co. Okay. Um, my goal, as long as it doesn't hit my spam, is to get back to you within 24 hours. Um, you know, is that's always my goal is, is to respond to everyone within 24 hours for whatever the request may be, even if it's just to say that I cannot help, but here's a resource. And you're on LinkedIn and that's how, how. Oh we, yeah. I forgot. We yes. LinkedIn. Yes. yes we'll we'll post it all not to worry, but Will, this was a pleasure. I learned so much. Thank you for being such a fantastic guest. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode of heartbeat for hire. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to heartbeat for hire. If you like what you hear, I'd love it. If you'd subscribe and leave a five-star review to keep the conversation going, you can find me on Insta or at LinkedIn at Lindsay Dowd, H4H, or you can reach me at my website, heartbeatforhire.com. Thanks so much. Have a great day.